We usually think of Handel's Messiah as a holiday classic, but what gets lost in the fame is its origin, an attempt to capture a bigger audience by an immigrant composer using his third language. That's not too far from what's being done in Boston by the Eureka Ensemble as part of its mission combining music and social change. Last year, the ensemble performed Messiah in Spanish with a live audience, and this year, the performances will be live streamed December 19th and 23rd. To tell us about this year's performance are the ensemble's executive director, Andres Ballesteros, and the music director, Cristo Candacci. Thank you very much for being with us, gentlemen. Thank you so much Chris. for having us. It's, it's good to see you during this time. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's good to see a musician these days in, in any form, <laughs> even on Zoom. <laughs> Um, I want it's to start with you, because, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because uh, you, you were involved in last year's performance, and I know this is a sort of a shorter version of the Messiah, but this isn't just a, a performance. This is a real, uh, I guess, community connection experience. So it tells mm -hmm. this is not just about doing something in a different language. You have a, really a different cast of people who were involved. Absolutely. So Eureka's mission overall is to nurture social change through music. And we do that in a number of ways, but mainly by uh, creating partnerships with local organizations and then finding a way to use music to address whatever issues that they're facing and bringing the whole community together. Uh, with Messiah, you know, it's one of the most performed works in the world. And we have this amazing partnership with the Chelsea Collaborative uh, in Chelsea, and where we work with immigrant and refugee youth through music education programs, get them to become a part of the community here and learn self-expression through the arts and through music. And so we thought when we were planning last year's holiday performance, what is Eureka going to do? What can we do for this holiday that is like special for our community, but also being you know, a part of the larger holiday experience? And, you know, there are, I think, like 40 different performances of Messiah in the New England area alone in like the span between the end of Thanksgiving to the, end, to the new year. And in thinking of the Chelsea community, we thought, why don't we take this incredibly performed work and make it available for a community that never goes to orchestra concerts? Actually, Chelsea is right next to Boston, but there is this huge bridge that divides it, divides the city and Chelsea. And so people never cross the bridge over into the city for many reasons. Um, and so what we did last year, we, our crack team, Andres Baisteris and our last year's assistant conductor, Ismail Sandoval, translated the Messiah and arranged it in a completely new way <laughs> in Spanish. And uh, we performed the entire first part with the Hallelujah Chorus at, uh, in Back Bay and even organize shuttles for people from Chelsea to come over into the city to experience this holiday music, this wonderful holiday tradition. Uh, Andres, uh, you know, this, this is a performance that's going to incorporate um, Spanish-speaking traditions, uh, mostly from, from this hemisphere. Uh, you know, the Christmas carols, Viancicos, uh, and, and the, the La Posada. Uh, what do the people from those communities get from this association with Handel's Messiah? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. And you mentioned Las Posadas, uh, which is this really beautiful Mexican tradition. And I'm Mexican American myself. Uh, so being able to bring this tradition of Las Posadas to the concert hall is something that is really exciting and really meaningful to um, every, uh, everyone I've spoken with at Chelsea, with my family. Uh, with uh, singers we've gotten from a number of places and being able to not only share those villancicos with the Basque community, but to be able to translate this classical masterpiece of the Messiah into Spanish um, is, is just something that's really special to me uh, as someone who's living in, in both of these communities. I think something that's really interesting to me is that in translating the piece, the piece itself changes, right? You kind of have to change some of the rhythms to make sure the words fit the music. And I think there's a really beautiful metaphor there for um, an, an immigrant community, right? You in arriving to a new home kind of have to change a little bit 
but there is no reason why the place you've arrived to shouldn't change a little bit as well. Um, and I think that's uh, what I hope this, uh, this translation and this performance can bring. Uh, it, it's tough for you because you, you're talking about King James Bible English, which is pretty good stylistically, and you're turning mm -hmm. it into maybe prosaic Spanish. I, I, I know what it's like when you turn great Spanish poetry into prosaic English. I get disappointed. So <laughs> how, do, how do you handle this? Yeah, no, it was, it was a really intensive but fun process. So Ismail and I would uh, sit down with music open, and we would find the King James Bible verse, and uh, we would find about... 12 or 15 different versions of that verse in Spanish from different Spanish editions of the Bible, and then work to mix and match in some uh, those different versions in a way that felt poetic and true to both the language and the music. Christo, uh, when you look back on last year's performance and, and you, you, know, you see the reenactment of Las Posadas and, and you hear the traditional carols and you have young people from the Chelsea Collaborative taking part, did that change your take on this music in the Messiah at all? Well, Andres put it very well with the rhythms. You know, when you add Latin rhythms to anything, it comes alive in a new way. <laughs> and uh, do you mean on the take of the actual piece? Yes, the, the Chris, piece, yeah. even just the spirit of the piece more than the particulars. Well, you know, I don't know if you've read about the premiere, but it, I think it had a standing ovation for like half an hour, something like that. There were so many people that stuffed the space. And while we didn't have that exact scenario last year, the, the energy and excitement of seeing an orchestra for the first time for many people in the audience, especially from Chelsea, uh, as well as when the during the Las Posada sections, hearing people sing from the audience, you you felt that point of discovery, almost experiencing it like as as a premiere. So, I I always imagine when I'm preparing a piece, what the as if it's a, a commission that I'm preparing for a premiere, and to get to do that with a piece that's over 300 years old is definitely exciting, <laughs> um, in every way. And Andres, if you go back about 50 years ago, as far as recordings of the Messiah, uh, I think a lot of us were conditioned to expect us how to have a cast of thousands to, to, to be convincing. <laughs> but, but, you know, more recently, you know, with advances in technology and, and changes in taste, you know, a, a dozen people singing this and a dozen people backing it up with instruments can sound pretty good. You can get a really full sound. So how do you do that now with live streaming? Yeah, that's a really good question. It actually also goes back to the roots of the piece. We were saying uh, earlier that the original premiere of the piece was with an amateur choir and amateur musicians. Um, so in that sense, it's really fun to be able to replicate the, the community feel of the original premiere in Dublin. So with technology and quite frankly, with the restrictions on the number of people that can be in any space, uh, we've had to be creative about it. So instead of the full orchestra, we were able to uh, work with a string quintet. Uh, so definitely scaling that down. Uh, and instead of an in-person choir, obviously singing is uh, particularly discouraged right now. Um, so instead we've put together a virtual choir of people from all over the Boston area, all over Massachusetts and even beyond. We have people from Florida, from New York, from Mexico City who are going to be participating in this choir. And I think the trade-off here is instead of trying to have this cast of thousands that's uh, reaching for the largest group of musicians possible, instead we're thinking, okay, how can we really make this a community experience, right? How can we hone in and focus on the people who are making this music together and build a, a cozier, tighter community. Christo, what, what about the uh, Chelsea component? And, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, this past year has been very tough for Chelsea. How does that change the complexion of things as far as taking part in this performance? Well, it's an ever-evolving situation, actually, because we've been, I think Andres actually can speak to this point more, but we've been working very closely with the collaborative throughout the pandemic um, to see if we can, to what degree we can keep our program alive. And they, 
the work they're doing right now is incredible. They're doubling as a food pantry for the community. I don't know if you know, Chelsea is one of the most heavily stricken areas in this part of, uh, in the greater Boston area with COVID-19 and many staff people, staff, yeah, staff people in uh, the collaborative have actually gotten COVID-19 as a result of working with the community. Um, and so there'll be weeks where we'll be in contact and then they'll say, oh, we have to hold off for the next few weeks. Somebody just got COVID-19 and we have to figure things out. But we've been trying to have our classes via Zoom and Andre said, I would defer to you at this point since you're actually the one teaching them. Yeah, yeah. Andres, what, what, what does that do, do for them, ha having this connection at least on Zoom? It's... Uh, oh, tell them, tell Chris about the rap battle. <laughs> oh my goodness. Are you so, going into uh, with a youngster? <laughs> yeah, we have, we have uh, several young students, several youth from La Collaborativa uh, in these music classes twice a week. Um, and on, on Tuesday, as Cristo is saying, sometimes there are challenges that are unique to Chelsea that come up and we, um, as a result of those challenges, we had a pretty small group on Tuesday, uh, which worked out great because we ended up having a couple of the kids engage in a, a half hour long rap battle, um, just sharing their experiences. And it was the friendliest rap battle I've ever heard in my life. Um, but it's, it's those moments of sparking joy through music in whatever way we can do it. Um, I think that is uh, what we can offer Chelsea right now. That is what La Colaborativa has asked us to offer right now because they are busy performing miracles in the food pantry, in fighting evictions. Uh, you, you said it, Chelsea has been unbelievably hard hit by this virus and anything at all that we can do to support in, in the smallest way, we, we will do it. I went finally, Chris, there. So we should oh, mention, yeah. it, it, yes, please. It, uh, we just have to finally let people know if, if they want to catch this live streaming and, and if it's free, we uh, need to tell them how they can get, get hold of that. So go to eurekaensemble.org and you, right on the front page, you'll see a button to register for the event. It's totally free to view. Uh, we're, the two dates that we're premiering the event is December 19th at 4 p.m. and the 23rd at 7 p.m. And if you go to eurekaensemble.org, it'll be live right on the front page. Okay. Well, but you thank can you. pre-register, yeah. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time to join us and wishing you luck with the performances. Thank Thanks you so Chris. much, Chris. Okay, that was Andres Ballesteros and Cristo Condacci from the Eureka Ensemble. We'll have more news in just a moment.